Well, here we are back on the theological antecedents with my good friend, Thomas. You all know now that he has his own YouTube site. So he, listen, you need to continue to go to his YouTube site. We've already put it up there to announce it. Um, he has now done away with his book, book case behind him. He now has a real house behind him and in a real room. <laughs> good for you, Thomas. Good to see you're like the rest of us. Uh, but what you are have done and what we're going to continue in this episode is to continue on with these this soup of this theological soup from which Islam came out of, uh, and much of this theological soup, as we're finding out, is based on Syriac Christianity, Syrian Christianity, and the many different discussions, the theological discussions that were happening on the ground. It stands to reason, if that was happening on the ground, then why are we surprised that Islam comes out of that and also reflects that? So you're going to continue with this same thing, moving and move one step further. So over to you, continue what you're saying. This is exciting. And we'll, I'll try to take notes and try to keep up with you as best I can. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Um, today, yeah, we're going to continue what we started uh, in, the, in the last episode. So looking at the Syrian Christian antecedents. And today I want to start with a bit of a recap, because now it's really the, the, point where all the threads come together. Um, so it helps to look at look at or revisit again what, what we've seen before. Um, so let me quickly share my screen. Yeah, here we are. So we're talking today about the Syrian Christianity in the Quran. And as I said, we're going to start with a quick recap. So as we've already learned, in the Sassanid Empire, Syrian Christians were not confronted with a majority of Hellenistic Christians, which means they did not have to defend their own theology to the degree they would have had to do in Western Syria. Um, so their theology was still mostly based on the Old Testament. The Son of God title was an honorary title and not taken literally. They used imagery rather than systematic definitions. So. Um, as we've also said before, they weren't so much interested in the nature of the universe, in the nature of God and all that. They were interested in understanding um, God, God's wishes, basically, and live a life according to his wishes. And after 410, which was the Council of Tessiphon, where the Nestorian Church adopted the Nicene Creed and also the Trinitarian view officially, um, the these Hellenistic ideas were forced upon the Church of the East. And within this Church of the East, the Syrian theology then only survived in the gaps. So that means a strict emphasis on monotheism and a strict separation of the human and the divine parts of Jesus, and, but still also a focus on proving oneself. But other than that, Sort of, it, it was sort of a Hellenization through the back door for the Nestorian Church. And the writers of the Quran, they rejected this Hellenization of their Syrian Christianity. Okay, let me just, so, so people understand, when you say this, uh, this rejection of Hellenistic, we're on the gaps, you mean in isolated pockets. Exactly, yeah. So um, the, the main, so the, the Nestorian Church wasn't as widespread as for instance, the Catholic Church was in the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. So they had so their, their core regions where they were really strong and well established with lots of bishops and so on. So that was mainly the um, Mesopotamia around Tessiphon, but, but all across Mesopotamia actually, and then some pockets here and there. But the further away you get from there, the longer this anti-Trinitarian Christianity survived, sort of. And then, but as the Nestorian church tried to establish itself there as well. So we talked about Merv, and we know that in the middle of the sixth century, Merv became a metropolitan um, or a seat for a metropolitan bishop. So they tried to establish themselves there, and then the locals would have, or the, those anti Trinitarian locals would have rejected that and then sort of formed a counter movement, if you will. Yeah. So we've also seen before that the Quran started out as a lectionary. So that's like the very earliest phases of it. 
but it was also intended to be a new Arab book of Deuteronomy. So it was teaching the right interpretation of the law in the tradition of Moses. Um, the fundamental, fundamental theology of the Quran um, comes straight from pre nascent Christianity. And last time we talked about the logos, that's actually also something that exists in Islam. But like with many Bible translations, there are also many different translations in Arabic for the term logos, because it can mean many different things, um, which we've also looked at last time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quote a few Quran verses, but I'm reintroducing the word logos where appropriate. And you will immediately see the similarities to what we talked about last time when we talked about Paul of Samosata and, and people like him. So Surah 1785, quote, the spirit is the logos from my Lord, but you have only received little knowledge, end quote. And Surah 16.2, quote, he lets the angels descend with the spirit from his logos upon his chosen servants, end quote. And then Surah 10.3, after the six days of creation, God sits on, his, sits on his throne, quote, in order to direct the logos, end quote. So what we see here is, Logos, spirit, and angels, they are all instruments or forces emanating from the one God, just like we saw with Paul of Samosata. It's a strict monotheism and a rejection of the Trinity, basically. Jesus was only a man who was inspired by spirit and logos. The theology is also based on proving oneself. Salvation is only achieved by following Jesus and the law instead of through the incarnation or the crucifixion of Jesus. And this was then later transferred onto Muhammad. Right? So nowadays you have to follow Muhammad. Um, but originally it was following Jesus. But we'll get to that uh, in a later episode in more detail. Um, Jesus was the servant of God, the Abdallah. And we also have a Syrian eschatology, where Jesus is very prominent as the judge at the end of days. And that's still... Uh, alive and well in modern Islam, actually. And in general, what we can say is that the so-called Meccan surahs, they read a lot like the preachings of early Syrian missionaries, which I think is also something that Odon is very <laughs> keen on pointing out. Um, so the reception of the Old Testament, as well as Jewish apocrypha, are likely also transmitted via Syrian Christianity and not directly from, from Jews or Ebionites. Um, but through sort of the mediation of the Syrian Christian movement that was around, because they've always had this, this close connection to the Old Testament and to some Jewish apocrypha. That was also always a big um, part of, of, of their religion. The gospel they would have used was the Dia Tesseron. So we've also touched on this before. This was um, a gospel written by Tatian in the second century, where he sort of combined the stories of the four canonical gospels and, and just wrote one gospel based on those. And the allegation that Christians falsified scripture might very well be a reaction to the four gospels being uh, translated into Ar Aramaic and slowly taking over as scripture. So in the Roman Empire, the Diatessaron was being replaced starting around the fourth century. Until the fourth century, the Diatessaron was the only gospel in Aramaic but then eventually it was deemed her heretical, and then the four canonical gospels were translated into Aramaic. But that didn't immediately translate into the Persian Empire. So that took some time. And yeah, so when that happened, it, it's very possible that this is what, what caused this, um, this allegation that Christians falsified scriptures, because those Aramaic Christians in the Far East, they would have only known the Dia Tesseron, and now people come along with four different Gospels. So they're saying, oh, wait, you're, you're falsifying scripture. Um, we also see that the diverse Christian landscape in Persia has left its, uh, its marks, and that's also something we looked at in the influences video. We see polemics versus Nestorians versus monophysites. We see harsh laws, restrictions for women's rules for fasting and prohibition of alcohol, which comes from Christian encratites. So they are also a subgroup of this Aramaic speaking Christian tradition. Um, the one that Tatian actually is from, the, the guy who wrote the Dia Tesseron. The anti-Judaism of the Anchorites is also reflected in the opposition to the Jews in the Quran. 
And then finally, the motif that Jesus wasn't really crucified is, of course, a docetist or a Gnostic motif. So now I want to look at what other Christian writers said about the new um, Arab rulers once they came, um, well, once the Byzantines abandoned the Near East, basically, and the, and the Arabs took over. And what we can see there is an interesting progression, is it, um, how, how the attitudes change, sort of. Um, so here we have, I have three, three people who wrote about um, the Arabs and their religion, and they were all high church officials. First one is Isoya III. He was the patriarch of the Church of the East, which is basically the, the equivalent to the Pope in the West, right? So he was sort of the, the Pope of the Nestorian Church. And he died in 659. So he must have written these letters before. We don't know exactly when he wrote them, but definitely before five, the 659. Um, and what has happened is he received a complaint from the church in Nineveh, which, which complained that the Arab rulers, the new Arab rulers, actually preferred the Monophysites over them. So the Monophysites over the Nestorians there. And in response, Isoya III wrote that the Hag Hagarines praise our faith, they honor our priests and saints, and they help the church and its convents. This does not sound like someone who's just been steamrolled over by a new religion. Um, quite the opposite. So from his perspective, the Arabs are actually quite friendly towards the Nestorians and even prefer them to the Monophysites. Um, well, one question remains here is that why then did the church in Nineveh complain? And to answer that, we need to keep in mind that there was no single caliphate just yet. So we're still in the at the time before the formation of the caliphate. We're rather looking at individual Arab emirates. And um, what is the most plausible explanation that I've come across is that the, um, the Ghassanids ruled over this area, which included Nineveh. So this is quite close to where the Ghassanids have always been. And the Ghassanids, they converted to monophysitism centuries earlier. So it would have been a local phenomenon that the local rulers in Nineveh would have obviously um, preferred monophysites because they were monophysites themselves. But elsewhere, uh, apparently, Arabs would have been also very um, favorable towards Nestorians. And there's definitely no mentioning of a new religion or anything other than Christianity here. So um, we have no evidence of, of anything like, like Islam. Then the next one we have is Anast Anastasius Sinaita. He was the abbot of St. Catherine's Monastery, also a highly regarded uh, theologian of his, time and of his time and still today. And he wrote sometime before 700, also a letter where he instructed others of how to deal with Arabs when it comes to the topic of religion. And what he said was, well, he was speaking to Catholics. So he was um, part of the Catholic Church or Orthodox Church, I mean, was the same back then. Um, so he wrote that, like us, the Arabs reject monophysitism. Right? So, and then also he writes, when talking to the Arabs, one has to reject false assumptions they may have about us, namely that there are two gods, that God fathered a son in a carnal way, or that any created being in heaven or on earth may be worshipped. And that sounds exactly like the kind of accusation somebody in the tradition of Paul of Samosata would throw at Trinitarian Christians. Right? So that um, so that they're two gods, right? Or, um, or that this that it's a pagan idea that God would father a son because uh, that implies having like physical sex with a woman, or that um, a created being, namely Jesus, would be worshipped. But he, he also says, once when you clear, clear that up right up front, you're fine. So, but we see how the attitudes shift slightly, right? So with Isoya III, it was basically all positive. Now with Anast Anastasius, it's more careful, is it? So you, you have to be careful. They are obviously not the same type of Christians that um, he belonged to. And now finally, we come to John of Damascus, 
he wrote uh, a book against heresies before 750. And in it, he names um, the religion of the Arabs as a Christian heresy. So he's now clearly against their religion. So we see this from supportive to cautious to oppose, opposing them in seven, around 750, slightly before then. Um, and he writes, for instance, they denounce us as idolaters because we venerate the cross. But we say to them, how do you rub on a rock underneath your dome and tenderly laugh the crack? Some of them say that Abraham lay with Hagar on it. Others say that Abraham tied the she camel to it when he went to kill Isaac. They venerate the rock and say it's the rock of Abraham. So this is a clear attack against uh, the religion of the Arabs. And um, I want to, to use this quote because this will tie into something we will look into a later episode when we look at the symbolism of the Dome of the Rock. But John of Damascus also says, Mahmed, so that would be Muhammad, says that Christ is logos and spirit of God, but created and his servant, and that he was born of Mary, the sister, um, that he was born of Mary, the sister of Moses and Aaron, without procreation. He says that the logos of God and the spirit entered Mary, and she gave birth to Jesus, the prophet and servant of God. And he says that the Jews wanted to commit the sacrilege of crucifying him. After they attained him, they did, however, only crucify his simulacrum. However, Christ himself was not crucified and did not die. As he says, God instead took him to himself in heaven because he loved him. So again, here we see the sort of, we see the, Syrian Christian um, analogies, but we also see that already by his time, this um, doctrine of Jesus not being crucified was well established. Or was it? Actually, we don't really know if this was by his time, because what we do know about his book on the heresies is that there are lots and lots of later interpolations, which makes also a lot of sense. In fact, if there's any type of book, this type of book, we would actually expect to see interpolations because as scribes copy these books of the centuries, if new information comes in, they obviously want to use it uh, if it works against the, the um, ideological enemy, if you will. And we know for a fact that there are interpolations. We're not sure if this is an interpolation or not. My guess is that there at least parts of it probably are. So that's why it's hard to say this was written before 750. It might have been, it might have been some time later. But the fact of the matter is that John of Damascus saw Arabs as Christian heretics and he was clearly against them. So we can see this progression from supportive to cautious to um, being enemies. Let me just uh, add, uh, put something real quickly yeah. or a question into this. You're assuming, therefore, I mean, we don't, do we have? the original manuscript of John of Damascus. Is that, um, is there, is, do we have an extent copy? Well, obviously we only have, no, we only have copies of copies of copies. So um, it's really hard to tell what exactly of, of these writings are original to him. And we know that there are interpolations. So some elements are clearly interpolations because they totally interrupt the flow of, of the text otherwise. But, but smaller insertions would be hard to identify. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now let's get to Muhammad. So the first time we see this MHMT logo or motto is on coins minted around 660 and they were first minted in Persis. So that's um, well in Persia, so but, but east of Iraq. And then as time progresses, these coins move westward. So they get minted in more and more Western places, so which is another argument that supports the idea that the, um, Islam or, or proto-Islam in this case had, had its origins in the Far East and not in the Hejaz. Um, and, but now I want to also focus on one thing, and that's these coins with the standing caliph. So many coins show a figure with a large, so, large sword and the text Caliphat Allah um, written on them. And this is traditionally interpreted to be, um, well, Abd al-Malik, the so-called standing Caliph, but names typically don't appear on these coins. What always appears is the title Muhammad. And sometimes um, 
the, the standing caliph is even depicted with a flaming sword. And that's actually clearly an eschatological image. Um, and this fits in with the eschatological understanding of the time um, with Jesus who returns to earth as God's representative, the Caliphat Allah, um, to hold judgment at the end of days. So what people like Volker Pop are saying, who has um, analyzed those coins in, in detail, is that this is actually not Abdul Malik, but Jesus as the judge at the end of times. And what we also see um, is if you look if you look at this coin, and that's actually something that that um, sh struck me immediately when I saw this, is that this sword doesn't look like a sword you would go to war with, right? It's it's very broad. It, it's not very pointy. This would be terrible to go to war with. It would be um, <laughs> hard to handle. It would be top heavy, so you, it would be exhausting to use. You couldn't stab anyone. Um, and you might say, well, it's a coin, what do you expect? Right? You can't put that much detail in it. But if you look at the figure, it's actually pretty detailed. So you could put um, that kind of detail on there. But the thing is, this type of sword did exist. There are swords that look exactly like this. It's just that they are not swords to go to war with. It, rather, they're executioner swords. Because when you execute someone, you don't need it to be pointy, and you want it to be top-heavy so that you can hit the condemned person with as much authority as possible. So that also fits in with this idea of looking at a sort of at a eschatological judge and not if, as not at Abdul Malik, the great warrior. Now, Odom, let me just say something here. Odom looks at the same coin. This coin, by the way, was is uh, Solidus, which was minted in 693 by Abdul Malik. And his view on this is that this is in reaction to the previous coin that he minted in 692, which was a picture of the three uh, the three Justinian and his two sons, and a mockery of them mm -hmm. because he takes the cross off their heads and off their, their hands. And on the backside, he puts a, a he takes the cross piece off the Byzantine cross. Abdul, uh, as uh, as in paying in paying his homage to Justinian, Justinian goes to war with him because of that, which is won by Abdul Malik. He wins the war, defeats Justinian, and introduces this coin in 693 with his sword there as a way of triumphalism. You won't you don't accept that then. You say that this is more symbolic. I would say it's more likely that it's, it's symbolic also because of the flaming sword, because it looks like an executioner's sword and it fits in with the eschatology. Obviously, by looking at only at the coins, it, it's difficult to say for sure one way or the other. So I wouldn't dis dismiss Odon's theory. Um, it's just, I, I, th I think that uh, Volker Pop has a point here, which um, I would tend to agree with a little bit more. Um, than with Odin's theory, but but uh, they're both valid, I guess, um, in, as possible explanations. Okay, you heard both points. You decide. Those yeah. listening to it, do you go with what <laughs> Volker Pop and Thomas are saying, or do you go with Odin? So as I say, I'm, I'm not dismissing Odin's Odin's point. I think that that's very possible. Uh, I just favor favor this one slightly more, but but there's not much between them. Um, but if, for me, it definitely fits with this eschatological um, view of the end, which was also very prominent back in those days. So we were really looking at a time where people expected the end to come very soon. Um, yeah. And also now coming to the backside of the, those coins, um, obviously the Abdul Malik removed the cross. So it looks very similar to the Byzantine coins, which had this, this Byzantine cross with those little squiggly lines at the, at the end. Um, he replaced it with this, um, well, a staff sort of that you see there. And often this is interpreted to be evidence for a new religion. But in reality, it's just that the Byzantine cross was a symbol of a competing form of Christianity and of the political enemy as well. And what Volker Pop also says is that what he's replaced the cr cross with is actually the Yega Sahaduta. So that's the Mount of Stones raised as witness between Jacob and Laban, which Jacob called in Hebrew Galid. 
So folk pop thinks that's what's now on this on this coin. And also important remember is that the cross in general played a much smaller role in Eastern variants of Christianity than in the West, because as we just said, salvation did not come from the crucifixion, but by following the footsteps of Jesus. And of course, eventually um, the Arabs also believed that Jesus wasn't even crucified. Um, don't know if that was already established at this point in time. It might have been, might have been a later addition. Okay, and that's uh, the end for today. So in summary, we, what we've seen is that an anti-Trinitarian Christology was widespread in Syria, and its core beliefs were that Jesus was just a man, that salvation is achieved by emulating Jesus and following the law and scripture, that in Western Syria, the Trinitarian view won out, but in Eastern Syria and further east in Persia, um, these... Christian, these Syrian Christian enclaves survived, and the Quran is a product of this anti Trinitarian Christianity. Okay, terrific stuff. Thank you, Thomas. Now, listen, this is like a summary. You've, you've got the whole package here in just a few minutes of what we have been doing for the last almost two weeks. Uh, it's an awful lot. For those of you who uh, say this may go be too much in just one segment, go back and see what Thomas has been doing in the previous videos on this subject, looking both politically and following what was happening from the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way up until the seventh century. And now theologically, what's been happening, especially from the second, third, fourth, and up into the fifth and sixth, because you need to both look both politically and theologically to see what then had an impact, what had an influence on Islam. This has been good. Thank you for this, Thomas. I'm sure we're going to get some feedback. It's been fascinating. I, something new that I hadn't heard before was how the Isoyao the third, and uh, how uh, you had uh, Anastasius Sinaita and also then uh, John of Damascus, their response to see what the Christians, because these are the Christians who are seeing this happening in their time and at their place, they are in the 7th, going up into the 8th century, up into the middle of the 8th century. They are watching this happen. This is their reaction. And from a reaction of kind of ambivalence, almost of support, to one of caution, and then one of actual antithesis, a polemic against them, you can see how that graded between 660 up until 750 in that first hundred years. This is, uh, I mean, it's a good point you're bringing here because what you're saying is it took a while for the Christians to wake up to see what was happening in their own midst is what you're saying. And um, this anti- And also I think, I think really, I think the point where this changed is also time of Abdul Malik. Because I think he really pushed this, this um, Arabization policy, but also then this push for this um, anti-Trinitarian Christology. Because that's, I think that's part of the reason that before that wasn't so prominent, so people would have been maybe more supportive. But with Abdel Malik, there was really this, this central centralized push um, into this one direction, which people then woke up to slowly. First Anastasius, but then more so with um, yeah, John of Damascus. Okay, and up down Damascus comes after Abdel Malik, Abdel Malik 685 exactly. to 705. We're talking about 733, 740, 750, uh, the time when uh, John Damascus is there in Damascus, the same city that Abdel Malik mm -hmm. ruled. So it would stand to reason that he is now really shutting down and really polemicizing against what he has has come out now it's interesting you say that because abdul malik we have said for years now i've been saying this almost since the 1990s that abdul malik is the kingpin of everything you've got to go to abdul malik not only because he's so big and huge and large and so powerful but what he did with the dome of the rock what he did with the coins what he did with the prelateful protocols had huge significance because that was a sea change in that part of the world and it takes a caliph of his power and, uh, and his um, charisma, because he was charismatic, to really make a change at this level. So I think what you're going to do next is to actually zero in on Abdul Malik. We've got to go back to Abdul Malik. And that's where you want to go to next. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So we're okay. going to look at Abdul Malik next. 
Uh, this is a good segue into that because we've got to deal with Abdul Malik. Um, listen, <laughs> anybody who's been following the seventh century, moving into the eighth century, you've got to go with Abdul Malik. You've got to go with the Dome of the Rock. You've got to look at those inscriptions. You've got to look and see what was being introduced at that time. Thomas, I can't wait because this is now you're getting into the area that I love the most. You're getting into the area that I would, uh, I think many of our viewers on this channel have been waiting for. So, Without any further ado, listen, for those of you who have been listening to this theological soup that is that is happening there, what is your opinion? Do you agree uh, with Thomas? Do you agree with Volker Pop? Maybe you don't. Maybe you'd like to go with Odin more on what these coins signify. Nonetheless, can you see there is a sea change happening? It is happening towards the end of the 7th century, moving into the 8th century. This has a huge uh, uh, significance for what Islam will become in the Abbasid period. But to understand what the Abbasids did with Islam, you need to see what the Umayyads were doing. And the Umayyads were paving the way, were starting the whole ethos, and were also creating the, in this case, the anti-Trinitarian view, theological view of what later became uh, Islam as we know today. Great stuff. This is good stuff. I love what you're doing with it. Exciting to not only have your new channel, but also to have you unpack this historical and theological overlay uh, lead up into Islam. All right. This is... Our good friend Thomas and Jay, 4,000 miles apart, over and out. Mm -hmm.